It's 11.11. Make a wish. Hi, it's Luna. Thanks so much for joining me today with the Hacking Hypermobility podcast. Today, I would like to introduce you to the conclusion of the series of episodes with Zebra Dudes. Shelly and I sat down with a panel of men with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or HEADS, back in Baltimore. I really appreciated their thoughts, and before we get into the episode, I have some introductory ideas, thoughts, and some zebra news. Uh, but first, my disclaimer before Shelly gets mad at me. So the information in this podcast episode is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. I'm not a doctor. Consult with your healthcare provider for personalized guidance on managing the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. So June is Men's Mental Health Awareness Month, and I suspect that many would agree that most men have been conditioned to view emotion and pain as weakness. I think it's really important to have inclusive conversations and acknowledge people's whole humanity. So this is a really interesting topic to introduce to you on the heels of some genetic research breakthroughs. Before we get into this episode and the final segment of our series with the men, let's jump into a zebra news segment. So yesterday, on June 11th, 2024, the medical researchers at Norris Lab at the Medical University of South Carolina released their preliminary report with a gene identified for the hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, or HEADS. This research has been widely anticipated. Um, so Dr. Courtney Gensmer is the lead researcher at Norris Lab that published this preprint with over 50 co-authors and released some really helpful explanations with infographics on her social media as well, which I will link in the show notes for you. So this is really a research sneak peek and it has not gone through what we call peer review in the science community. This means there's more information and data and we will expect revisions after other scientists review their work. So they share this preview with the quote, hope to accelerate research progress and foster collaboration while their study goes through the peer review process. So that's their intention of giving us this sneak peek. So when the manuscript was released yesterday, it was noted that these initial findings do not explain all heads cases and should not be used to exclude you or anyone from diagnosis. The intention of their work is to, quote, contribute to the broader landscape, helping improve diagnostic tools and develop future treatment options that may benefit the whole Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome community. So I think that was some really key information to note um, that was just on the social media post from Dr. Gensimer. So without that information, if you just read the manuscript, you may miss out on that key information. Um, so what makes me personally hypermobile emotional is witnessing advancements from the efforts of a fellow zebra. And I know a lot of younger zebras that are currently studying genetics or medicine. Um, and Courtney Gensmer is a PhD researcher at Norse Lab at MUSC who um, is very pivotal towards research for the HEADS gene. Um, and she's the primary author of this manuscript that came out yesterday. So watching the younger generation of the zebras navigate their health conditions on their own because they were diagnosed earlier, younger, and then they were able to be accommodated as they made it through the rigors of higher education and then very actively and profoundly contribute to advocacy work and medical research is something that is not lost on this Fendi mama. Um, I shared these thoughts today on social media and I wanted to share some of my listeners' um, thoughts. So I'm going to read um, from you, the listeners, some of your thoughts on this research being released on the heads gene. A listener, Jody, said, because of the awareness raised by the ones before them, you've passed the torch. 
Thank you to all the creators who add to this community. Alyssa said, my diagnosis did one amazing thing. My kid can get the help I never got. Calf said their son begins his journey to become a nurse practitioner specializing in EDS this month. At his age, I had zero clue EDS existed, let alone that I had it or that accommodations could be made. So many of our listeners and those in this community contributed our genetic information even to this study. Other listeners expressed some hesitation and concern. Maddie said, I do not have this gene, and this stuff makes me nervous because I absolutely have heads, and I don't have any of the genes that they've found thus far. Equinolab said, my worry is that people won't understand that most people with heads are not going to have this gene variant, and that most research has been done on white people, and not enough on epigenetics and treatment for what we know now. So I completely agree. These are really valid concerns and efforts I've been working towards in our advocacy work here on the show and on my own social media platform. So this article about the HEDS gene discovery is interesting, also considering the more recent article coming from the same lab about the phenotypes that they've identified in the HEDS study as well. I adore our zebra herd, and all of the EDS news has been such a great reminder to me, despite our hesitations, of how much more advocacy work and research work there's still to be done, but how much good work has happened, how far we have come. And so on a personal note, um, from the Bendy Mamas, from me, Luna, Shelly, my co-host, and Tiffany, our producer, we have some great news. The Hacking Hypermobility podcast will be traveling to attend the 2024 Global Conference in Philadelphia in July. And your generosity and support as listeners can help us do things like attend conferences and represent you and patient voices in these spaces or help us purchase things like new podcast equipment to bring you better quality shows or more importantly propel the effort to make our voices louder. So please go to the show's website at hackinghypermobility.com and click shop to donate whatever fits your budget. Our community has expressed a really valid concern that research participants are not truly representative, which is why the Hacking Hypermobility podcast has shifted our perspective and we are very actively elevating marginalized voices. And this is one of the crucial reasons why we need your help. We can't do this alone. Um, I know we all struggle with spoons and how to distribute our resources. If Luna or Shelly or the Hacking Hypermobility podcast has made a difference in your health journey, would you please consider passing on this gift by supporting the show? So with that being said, while I respect greatly the work being done by the medical institutions, the researchers, the advocates, and groups like the EDS Society, I think we as a whole as a zebra community, could do a better job of being more inclusive with the intersectionality of disability. Um, Even though the medical research hasn't caught up to these sentiments, we can do that here in our own community. The season um, currently happening now with Hacking Hypermobility is our second season, and we have talked to women of color as well as this curious intersection of men with this disability that is widely perceived as a women's condition. When Shelly and I sat down to talk to our Zebra Dude friends, we learned so much from Brandon and Brian and Doug, who have differing experiences and perspectives. A universal experience um, from the men that stuck with me was when Brian explained how he had to shift his way of thinking about his pain that was rooted in how he was taught to be a man. Uh, Brian is a Marine Corps veteran, and he so often heard the adage in the Corps, pain is weakness leaving the body. And in this series, he talks about transmuting the sentiment and adopting a new adage, healing is weakness leaving the body. 
So witnessing our bendy dudes form this small little community on the show was a really special moment to me, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope it inspires you to check in on your community and offer support where you have spare spoons. Where there is pain, offer healing. And now the last segment of our panel interview with the Zebra Dudes. Serious question. Seriously, though. So do you have emotional and family support? And uh, and by family, that's chosen family, too, or however that looks like. What does that look like for you? Or is it something you have to fight for? Like, I, I'm very lucky. So I feel, I almost sometimes feel bad talking about how much support I get from my partner because I have friends in the community who get like zero support or like their spouses or partners leave them or mistreat them or gaslight them. I actually, yeah, I I have a best friend who's a Zebra right now whose husband filed for divorce this week because he said he could not handle her health condition. Yeah. Shit bag. Shit bag. Yeah. And I don't care if you hear it. What, what a terrible human being. I don't know you, John. In sickness and in health, huh? I, I hope that he's never able to find a woman to marry him ever again. Okay. Anyhow, answer, answer the question with your own perspective, though. Just wanted to. I will say that I want to go first just because uh, I'm in the same boat as you, Jelly. I'm extremely um, fortunate in that, uh, you know, I, we have a very small family. It's my wife and I, and we have, we have one child. Um, and um, I have a, a parent, her, her mom lives nearby. Um, that helps a ton. And, um, other than that, it's, uh, it's, you know, pretty much us, but, um, I will say that I am very fortunate in another way in that, uh, you know, as a veteran, I do have a lot of support networks for just disability in general that many people do not. Um, and that is always, um, kind of a double-edged sword to address and say, you know, hey, I, I, I love that I have this benefit. I hate that I had to have it, but, you know, um, tough tough line to walk there yeah. in, the, in the same kind of vein, Shelly. Um, so that's my, my take on it. Uh, what about you, Brandon? We heard a little bit about your partner. Oh, God bless that man. He puts up with so much, so much of my shenanigans. Every, like, the, like, I think it was two months ago. I was like, oh, my God, I'm having a heart attack. I can't see. I can't think straight. He's like, did you drink your electrolytes? (laughs) I I don't even get asked anymore. I just, let me, no, no, let me. Oh, sorry, sorry. I am going to tell you what a day in the life of this couple looks like because I was just so mad and jealous. So like Alec is her, her husband walks in with just a jar of electrolytes he's made and goes here or he's like, it's time to eat. Like he doesn't even ask. He just, I really hate it when he goes to the office because he comes home and I'm like, I haven't eaten anything. And I clean the whole house. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, well, the house looks great. It's like a. But, it's but like you're a, a pile on the floor. And then I say, "Don't perceive me. I'm embarrassed." It's, but it's I. It I do recognize that it's rare. Yeah, um, I know so, how lucky I am, which is why I don't. I don't talk about it a lot because I don't want people to think yeah. I'm bragging or be. But everybody deserves. No, it. And I, I didn't, have. I everybody didn't deserves that. that. Um, so I and I'll say just, from my I'm perspective, to call out the partners like Katie and yeah. Alec and Daniel. And Doug, I don't, you haven't mentioned yet specifically, I want to ask you too, because you're in a, in our stage of life. Like, I want to recognize partners that deal with this because I know that's not an easy uh, relationship dynamic, but, you know, to really walk that walk and, you know, care for someone with disability um, and be part of, you know, a family maybe in a way that you didn't anticipate when you went into it. Cause a lot of times we progress as we age. I just, if, you, if, if family members or partners are listening, I want to encourage you and, and say thank you because 
you can't take care of the people that I love and you are you are seen that's all yeah um, yeah. What about you, Doug? Who's your support system? Uh, so I'm in kind of a very interesting place that we have a multiple disability household in that uh, my wife is a type 1 diabetic. Uh, she's been insulin dependent since she was 18 months old. 18 months. <laughs> yeah. She she became potty trained and then two months later, uh, unpotty trained, or I think it was 18 months, something something of that along that lines. Um, but yeah, wow. um, uh, and then our, our younger daughter, the one that is not HEDS diagnosed is also a type one diabetic. That's genetic. So, so, so me and the older one and then her and the younger one. That's so and, that. Yeah. At the time at, yeah, when we were looking to have kids, we were told that the, you know, diabetes is, there's no, nothing that shows that it's uh heritable, but type one specifically heritable. Type one, yeah. Since then, we found out that um, that is not the case. It is quite heritable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> they yeah. kill you. Yeah. My, my so, father-in-law is a type 1 diabetic. Um, so currently, it is just uh, me and my wife in the, in the household. The two girls are at college right now. One's a freshman. The other's a sophomore. Um, and like kind of pre-diagnosis for me, I, I was the i guess the rock in the family the 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 uh the laborer uh, to say yes. you know yes. I, I i did i did the yard work i did everything i'd go out on a saturday morning and change the oil in two cars and you know be out doing 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 stuff outside for you know the whole day and then i'd come in and just fall over or i'd fall over while i was still outside just just go go in, in, until that fall over happened and realized I didn't have lunch I didn't have anything to drink I was you know so dehydrated I was sunburned and I just fell over um, and I guess since diagnosis uh, I've I've learned you know to pace pacing has been massive for me um, and it also kind of fits into the way that my weird brain works is uh, you know faced with the task I will say that task is too big and I'll just put it off. So now I break a task up into like say 20 minute sections and not just for ease of my brain clicking them off, but after that 20 minute session, I will sit down and say, and, and do a whole sort of self-evaluation. Am I thirsty? Do I need to go to the bathroom? Do I need to sit down for a minute? Do I need to lay down for a minute? You know, and that can all be in the course of, that can all be just 30 seconds. And then I will, you know, take on the next next portion of the task and that that has changed my life but it's it's been a big difference in the way the household works <laughs> and i was gonna say that chunking it up that is a good hack for um and homework if you have a child doing tasks that was actually one of the things that was on my son's iep mm -hmm. was giving instructions break up break it up or if you have a yeah. long test give them like five questions that go do these five questions bring it back to me like after you do the five questions do a lap around the hall then come back do these next five questions so that's yes. that's a great tip it's very yes. hard to get into hyper focus so yes i like literally will like set timers. yeah yeah and that that same sort of hyper focus ability uh, or tendency to hyper focus and just put your head down and go until you fall over it makes mm -hmm. me really good at my job <laughs> yeah. and they'll, they'll take so advantage of it too and us. and you know, you know i i cannot be distracted if you present me a problem at work or you know some some math problem or some this machine isn't working right i will ignore all else until i have figured out exactly what's wrong with that the ways um, capitalism takes advantage of us yeah yeah <laughs> well and once i once I started getting into, you know, therapy and emotional work, I, I realized that my brain works in a way where I, I will solve a problem for myself, whether it's the right solution or not. And then I learned that the Marine Corps taught me to make quick decisions and not right decisions. And then I had to reevaluate everything that I, you know, based my logic on. <laughs> so you guys have already started talking in this context. Uh, but so how does this sort of stuff, you know, the hypermobility and the the things that come along with it, how does it affect your vocation and your career, that sort of thing? It stopped mine. I haven't worked since April of 2022. So two years. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. As a drag queen, I see a lot of people with similar symptoms because it a lot of the same yeah. personality quirks end up doing the same hobbies and because it's so present in people who present as ADHD. ADHD loves cross-dressing for some reason. Absolutely adores it. There's so much to do. So it's very like it's very stimulating and mentally satisfying. So any room I walk in, I could just pull on someone's skin. It's just gonna just I would like right someone else's skin actually. Wow. In a non serial killer way. We made, that's our second Silence of the Lambs joke. Yeah. Actually, it's our third if you oh, count yeah. the one that's off camera. Oh, I don't like that. Anyway. Where I, we? I, th I think in my job, I've gravitated to uh, you know, what I'm good at. I, I had a desk job for a number of years and I felt like crap. Um, you know, my, my only exercise was getting up and going to the bathroom or getting coffee, then back to my desk. And I just basically ended up sitting in my chair on the computers, spinning around in circles like a Tasmanian devil because I could not get comfortable. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the other coworkers come, would come by and say, why are you kicked back with your feet on your desk and your keyboard in your lap and, you know, alternating, being twisted up in different directions. And it's, <laughs> it, it, it didn't suit me. Yeah, everybody, everybody's smiling because we all know. But yeah. uh, greatest thing about being promoted to a uh, test lead was I got my own office and I could put a yoga mat in there. Very nice. So yeah, now now doing what I do, I I'm free to get up and move around and even encouraged to you know ex explore and move and twist and bend and it it keeps me motion in motion. Um, I, I figured out you know, a long time ago that my body was built to move, not to, not to be in one spot for, Things I mean, even great. right, right. As, as we sit here right now, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm twisting in my seat. Just, just oh, like well, you see me. I'm, I'm crawling yeah. across the king size. Yeah. I, I just had ankle surgery, but that's, you know, uh, I was going to say there's a great OT, like, her name is escaped me at the moment, but she has saying at one of the EDS conferences, it's stuck with me ever since she, she said, uh, motion is lotion. Yep. And that is just, yep, that is it. That's all you need to hear. And everybody can go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I definitely feel better. One of, I love reformer Pilates because gravity is not my friend. Like I can't stand, like I can't do the like standing exercises like I used to do. And, it bar. Yeah. and so um, I liked bar, but I didn't like the rah-rah of bar. Yeah, and what I like about the reformer like is like I get on the reformer and I'm in my space and no like. It's your space. She's not like, good job, Shelly. Yeah. Like get out of my face. Like I should have known I was autistic. I also, so I switched. I mainly do strength and cardio in the water. Um mm. Really, I would say it put my dysautonomia into controlled remission. Not, it's it has its means, but it's funny you say that. When I was in my in the Marine Corps, I was very into swimming. I was not for any Marine Corps listeners out there. I was not a McWiss. Uh, I wasn't a, an instructor, but. Uh, I would I I did become an ampit instructor, which was basically just water aerobics for Marines. But I would that was you know whenever we'd split up Marines and you know uh, split up days when we had a PT, I always took pool day. We're Listen, all going I to the pool. I can swim for three hours. I can't hardly run for more than three miles, and now I'm not going to try. But I will. Yeah. If you have shoulder mobility or hypermobility issues swimming swim strokes can actually make it worse uh my pt was like you need to stop swimming so you need to do other moves like safer moves so i don't i rarely swim last now but what about like on a kickboard so that it's uh, like, yeah so like if you can get stable you can get uh, stable yeah, on the board and then yeah, do the yeah so other moves like the typical swim strokes aren't great if you're working on i should never stability. keep my well, never do it and that chop protocol that I, I mentioned earlier, you know, they, I use a row machine, but one of the like recommended exercises for your intervals of exercise is just kickboard, you know, just on a kickboard 
doing dental laps, you know, yeah. so that POTS program, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia one, um, yeah, is really gentle is like that. Position while right. you're doing cardiovascular mm -hmm. It really does, that protocol really it has made a difference. Does anyone else get this feeling when they leave a pool? A like a year ago, I was in a wade pool in Mexico. Lovely, lovely place. Went there basically every day of the trip. I would just wade around, but I every time I would walk up those stairs to get out, it was like I was putting on a vest that was exactly. 70 pounds. Yes. Just, I, think, just I think I know the answer. Hmm. Um, so when we're in the pool, part of the reason why our dysautonomia gets better is because of something called baroceptors which are in your cardiovascular system and they detect blood pressure and air pressure and stuff. And that's part, it tells your autonomic nervous system to adjust. Um, so I think if you have a dysautonomia um, challenge like POTS or, or static intolerance, that sort of thing, we're slow to adapt. So that's the answer. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I feel amazing in the water. Um, I, I don't like to really swim on the surface, like the conventional swim strokes and stuff, as, yeah. as mentioned, aren't, aren't good for, for things, but, uh, I love to be underwater. Like I I've gone to the, to the Y and done laps, but I bring fins in a, in a mask yeah. and I, and I, I'll, I'll dolphin kick for half the length of the pool underwater, yeah. come up, breathe and continue on. Yeah. 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 So we're um, all just I'm, beached mermaids. Uh, yeah, exactly. Beached mermaids. Perfect. <laughs> I, we I need to a, add salt to our diets. We collect thingamabobs. Do there you go. Um, oh. I'm I'm Mer scuba cert I'm scuba certified, and some of the best time in my life was um, yes, was doing I scuba stuff un underwater, upside down. I felt like this was my natural home. You know, I literally almost took a job and moved to the Virgin Islands so I could just scuba all day. Yeah, and then I was like, "Well, there's not a hospital here." So yeah, idea. my then, only experience is in the helicopter dunk tank. Where they put you into Where a simulated do. helicopter and turn it upside down. Yeah. You have a canister of air and you have to swim out to pretend like it's a helicopter. A, went down. The spare air. Yeah, I've seen that on video and it looks terrifying. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun. I never pursued it. it they were like, because all the guys in Okinawa that do the dunk tank are also the scuba instructors. And so they were like, do you, you're here for six months. Do you want to learn how to snorkel? You know, scuba and i'm like no that's i just did it that was awful i don't want to do that <laughs> but, but i will say i thought it, i was scared of it but i i just like immediately adapted to it so yeah that's cool it, feel, it feels uh, being underwater feels like my body's natural home for some reason like it doesn't hurt to move i don't feel weird i can be in any position uh, you know co completely upside down looking straight you know ahead of me at fish on the bottom of a pond or you know whatever <laughs> And I, I, it's, it's, it's a bizarre experience when you think about it, but I ab absolutely felt at home in that environment, but then getting out just like, just, just like men you mentioned, Brandon, um, I, f I felt like I weighed a thousand pounds and I started to see colors when, as, as my knees got out of the water, hmm. just you know, from, from my body like being in, in the water that long, really maybe yeah, more tired than I normally would. Yeah. I don't get the gravity feeling. I just can't the temperature regulation issue. Yeah. Even once I'm cooler oh, no. and I put a shirt on, I'll it'll like a few minutes later it'll be like wet again. I was like, I was dry just a minute ago. So like I have to be <clears throat> I have to do this weird thing where I have to like air dry. So mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah. Even though I feel yeah. cool because the second I put I mean Certain people in the house are not showers. sad about me standing around a fan naked. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one else is seeing it, as far as I know. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and then, and then after some sort some exertion like that, I I will feel awesome for maybe a half an hour or an hour, and then I will just fall over and be done for the day, just completely. I you know irresistible sleep just uh, what do you call it post exertional malaise or something it just yeah. I'm just just out like a light yeah with that's no that's control cool. of it do you do you guys also have the delayed onset of muscle soreness doms yeah the last the last time I went to a gym 
I did a whole bunch of cable machine stuff and felt amazing and uh, felt amazing the rest of the day. And the next morning I woke up and I, I could not move my arms for like three days. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I've I've worked out a lot, like like you were saying, Luna. You know, um, doing strength training and stuff. Uh, for me, I, I found I found as I've gotten older because I did work out heavily and consistently all through my my twenties that um, the soreness from the workouts started to hit a little bit later and a little bit later and last a little bit longer and a little bit longer and to the point now where if I it doesn't even have to be a workout. If I overexert myself just in real life, it it's going to catch up to me. And it's going to last a long time. And it's I just- think part of that is, so like our, we have like body guarding, like muscle guarding. And so there's tension in our muscles. And so that, that causes like a release of chemicals and acids and stuff. Um, so I think like those muscle spindle fibers just are constantly like under stress uh in our bodies and then you throw in some challenging like intentional strength training so it's something for us strength training really does have to be isolated on uh like our supportive muscles first and then building up to you know the bigger muscle groups but also building up strength slowly is more serious i would say for us so like any like if you're you heard me say oh strength training was great for me don't just like dive right into it you know like work with a you know physical medicine rehab physician get help with it yeah the last pt i saw also told me just because of the way i am and the way i need to co-contract muscles to move and all that to do any activity i'm spending about 50 percent more energy than a normal person and I want to go back to what you just said. Mm-hmm. Doug said to co-contract muscles. If you don't understand what he's saying, our muscles don't work the same because of our hypermobility. So like what I said, we have some weak, weird weaknesses and that sort of thing. Like we're double working or triple working. Mm-hmm. Our muscle movements are not doing the same as like a typical body. Um, can I unmute? getting caught on the... How do I unmute you? I muted Brian just for a minute because his he's frozen. Is he frozen? Oh no, no, he's not. He I just, just I still. muted you. Can you unmute? I just want to make sure you can unmute yourself. I muted you real quick because your huh? some sound in your space kept cutting in on. Oh, I kept oh, seeing it pop it. in. Oh, there he's back. Probably my son. Yeah, my yeah, my yeah. So was, that's that's the only reason why I muted you. But then I freaked out because I couldn't unmute you. <laughs> so. Well, um, you know, I, I'm about to have to run, but um, before I do, I, I'm heading out to, to ketamine therapy, and I thought that maybe I'd, um, you know, see if anybody had any questions or, or wanted to know more about that. I've been, my pain doctor mentioned it. It's it's on a list for me, but I'm actually going to maybe investigate um, to see if I have um, dopa responsive dystonia. Because my move, and it's that's actually something else that Megan mentioned. Just watching me move around and all of my other things. So I'm getting. I have a pelvic MRI soon, and then I'm going to maybe see a movement doctor because I think I have some hip issue. But ketamine, I would love to. Yeah, that's on my list. So maybe we can. Well, yeah, I don't have any direct direct questions now, but whatever you want to share. Yeah, you know, I I'll, I'll say this. You know, I I was referred specifically for PTSD and, um, not for pain. Um, but just anecdotally, right. As I've had these surgeries on each limb, right. Right hand, which you write a lot with your right hand, especially if you're a test engineer, especially if you're a Marine, you store up a lot of just memories there's so many nerves that are connected through your hands and upper body to your sense of the world. Right. And I've found that healing from physical surgeries has also helped with healing from mental traumas. And so after each of my surgeries starting, I think after the third one is when I got sent to ketamine therapy, whenever I started on my legs, um, 
each surgery has I followed up with, with ketamine therapy and it's helped with both healing from trauma and um, just healing in general from the surgery. Now, all of my surgeries were neuroplasties for the most part, which is where they were moving the nerves around. And there's a lot of thought about how the ketamine, you know, process, healing process works, uh, supposed to be neuroregenerative. I can't really speak to that specifically other than to say it's worked every time that I've done it. And it's been huge for me in my process of accepting Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, accepting that I'm not the normal person that I thought that I was, that life is very different than what I understood it to be. Um, ketamine has helped a ton with that along with therapy. So ketamine is helped We're, with more than one thing and is especially the practice of acceptance. Yeah. I've heard amazing things about ketamine. Yeah. And, and I saw Doug, do you want to share about low dose naltrexone? Yeah, it, it is something that came up in my research and, um, I've been on it for almost two years now. And, uh, as a, I guess a pain reliever, you know, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, pain reset, pain resetter. Uh, and, and it does, it does help drastically. I would say my everyday discomfort that was maybe a six or a seven is now a two. Yeah. Uh, but something it's, it's done is given me energy that I've never had before. The whole chronic fatigue thing is, I think I'm almost feeling like a normal person really? as That's far right. as fatigue, as far as fatigue goes, like it, it's, it's been, it's been insane with a reduction in fatigue, boost in energy, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I, 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 I I don't hesitate to just jump up and do something now. Yeah. If, you know, versus sitting and weighing, you know, how sore will this make me, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I'm on traditional pain management. Um, so opiate therapy. Um, but that is really, really situationally dependent for me. Uh, you know, all these surgeries have, have kind of made that, um, I'm very glad that I have that tool, right? This is part of that acceptance and not having to suck it up because if I have that mentality, I, I would have been sucking it up for the last two years through, through surgeries and um, mm -hmm. you can't do that forever. So, you know, I'm excited to kind of get past this stage and give low, low dose track down another try. I've tried it initially and I'll save that for the book, but um, oh. yeah. Who did you guys go to to try um, LDN protocol? My psych did it for me the first time. I I approached my primary care physician. My pain specialist put me on LDN for two months, and it made me really sick. So now it's we're trying something new. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard that also. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard it's either it's great or it's like not great. Yeah. So yes, yes. Um, okay. It worked on well, the pain. Is there anything else that you want to discuss or further highlight that you think we maybe didn't miss or something or any like question you want to ask us that, or ask like, each other or ask? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just like to throw out there before, you know, before it gets lost is that uh, the genetics says that males and females should have EDS, you know, equally. Yes. And I think and I think there's a lot of guys out there suffering in silence that I, you know just ho like hopefully the, uh, find their the way women, to all of the autistic women who were lost, just like all yeah. of the the men if the pain. It's like with, with so, just, yep. Yeah. Um just looking at my own family, like I can see it's pretty equally affecting the genders. Mm -hmm. Like but in terms of diagnosis, there's a gap for sure. We don't have a lot of men in my family. Like my dad had three daughters, but my dad, and I'm not, I'm not really, we have a weird, whatever. Um, he was a diver. So that tells me what I need to know. And he was good at it. And my son can do like prayer arms behind his back and has all the finger stuff. So he doesn't have a lot of pain right now, but he does some of the stuff he has mentioned is potsy. Yeah. So we're just, we're just keeping an eye on him. And my daughter or my youngest is definitely, and the they, men they have, they, they have more shit going on. Yeah. The I men did. in my family typically really didn't like fall apart 
become what you would they would say is disabled until like really middle aged or later. Like yeah. I mean, my dad was running until his fifties, and oh my, my dad was active duty for twenty nine yeah. years. I yeah. mean, yeah, wow. Um, but so now it's the, very very. This is my take on the on the gender. Yeah. Uh, split because I, this this question tortured me right because um, I'm right there with you. You know, I'm looking at the numbers and it wasn't matching up, and uh, it was part of a whole like psych psychiatric freaking crisis that I had. Um, but I think that what it comes down to, in my opinion, this is what I've kind of what I think is that uh, trauma, the trauma, the amount of trauma that you have in your life it affects how you express so we're we might be equally presenting but just inherently in life women experience more trauma just i mean one right off the bat it's childbirth right like how many eds zebras do we see that they had a baby and then everything all those symptoms started and so i think that part of the gender gap is also a gap in expression because there are, you know, physiologically speaking, there's more chances to go wrong. Maybe well, I don't just know. That, that no, but not, no, I mean, there's there some guys who just they they do, they don't have very traumatic lives, <laughs> you know. And 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 a woman, you know, may not have the same. And I'm just saying, the average citizen, right? Um, yeah. Women are going to have that major. That's you know, not universal, but, but it's going to impact a large majority it's an intersection. And that, will be, that, you know, that's a very large, you know, medical event in a person's life yeah. is just not going to occur in males. I, I think also a, a big kick in sort of separating the division from those who have the same genetics is, you know, at, at puberty, males get testosterone, which tightens them up, makes them stronger. It's sort of anti EDS symptoms. And ladies get estrogen and progesterone, which loosen them all up well, and, and make things worse. And the more, I mean, men's hormones fluctuate, but not, not as unpredictably yeah. as women's can. Not, yes, yes. I don't know. I, I'll say they fluctuate and it's unpredictable. And I can't tell if it's the moon or my wife or me. I don't know. Um, I think also we're, you know, men are socialized differently. Well, that's yeah. that's yeah. my next point. Okay, so men get diagnosed sooner, but there's only four studies that we really found, and it all spoke to how well you could perform athletically. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, like, you know, the women on the red carpet, what are you wearing? And it's like, okay, men, how does this affect you and your ability to, like, it's, be the burly? It's very objectifying. So, and yeah, like, is what I got out of it. Yeah, that's, well, and, that's, you know, the way that I made it through active duty Marine Corps was by being the smart sergeant. I was not going to be the guy that you sent to carry a machine gun. That you really would wreck me. Solver. And I would there, be, you, you were the uh, problem solver. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's like adaptations that we make in our lives mm -hmm. that, Without you know, just, it's a, it's a, it's a human experience. What about, about you, Brandon, any final thoughts? Thank you for joining. I'm so glad. I One thing I think is that EDS is, probably a lot more prevalent than people give it credit for because a lot of my symptoms were present in my mother and it wasn't until someone told her no 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 because um she said everyone gets dizzy when they get off the couch everyone wakes up during surgery sometimes no they don't yeah no mom yeah i think if everyone did it you would hear about it more often <laughs> i i have the overwhelming urge to be like, I want to see pictures of your mom now. And, you know, we always joke about how we all vaguely look alike, right? Do you guys see it? Or is it just me? Uh, I can see. I can see it with me, Brandon. Doug? <laughs> yeah, I can see it with me and you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's there. Yeah. <laughs> My final thought. <laughs> Whoever our our great 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 ancestor is, he's uh laughing yeah. wherever he's at. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Bendy motherfucker. <laughs> Strong mean genes. Carry it, carry it. I got all the areas. Yeah. Okay, I really do gotta run. You guys Bye, take go it get easy. Your good drugs. Thank you, Brian. See you, Spoonie.
Um, Bye. So I think we'll go ahead and close out the episode, but um, that was fun. I want to say thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So that was the end of our series with the zebra dudes. As I reflect on my gratitude for Brandon, Brian, and Doug, I think about how they so vulnerably shared their experiences with hypermobility. And with the added perspective of the news this week of the preliminary Heads Gene manuscript from Norris Lab, I have some additional thoughts. There is a strange beauty and something so painful coming to fruition, and creating community. We are the village. So thank you so much for joining the Hacking Hypermobility podcast today. Now, please go give us some reviews, stars, comments, something to show you're listening and share with whatever social media platform, whether you're listening or watching a video, go rate us. Um, And I'm going to leave you with Brian's adage, healing is weakness, leaving the body. Oh, in a reminder of our disclaimer, the information provided in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered as medical advice. Consult with your healthcare professionals for personalized guidance on managing the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. Bye!